Welcome to Podcasts on Demand, a continuing medical education activity. This activity includes the most recent and current clinical data presented by leading experts. If you are seeking continuing education credit, please review the disclosures and the requirements for a successful completion of the activity prior to listening to the podcast. A link is found in the podcast description that can direct you to this information. Welcome to this edition of Clinical Clips, an accredited continuing education activity. This brief expert video will spotlight the daily hot topics from the conference. Thank you for joining us for ACC conference coverage, Clinical Clips and Heart Failure. My name is Peter Toth, and I'm the Director of Preventive Cardiology at the CGH Medical Center in Sterling, Illinois, and also Adjunct Professor of Medicine in the Division of Cardiology at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. In this clinical clip, I will provide expert interpretation of the latest advances in the treatment of heart failure presented at the 2024 American College of Cardiology Conference in Atlanta, Georgia. There were some remarkably interesting abstracts presented at ACC in the area of heart failure, and I'd like to take you through six of the more interesting ones that I found particularly useful clinically. Our first abstract is one by Asim Khan and co-workers, and it is a meta-analysis of randomized clinical trials looking at the impact of SGLT2 inhibitors in acute decompensated heart failure. Eight studies were included, and the results are pretty remarkable. If you look at the impact of SGLT2 therapy on major acute coronary events, the authors found a 36% relative risk reduction for 90-day all-cause mortality, a 62% relative risk reduction. There was no impact on renal dysfunction, and there was also no increase in risk for urinary tract infection. And obviously, this is a long-standing concern for clinicians because the SGLT2s do waste glucose out of the glomerular ultrafiltrate and into the bladder, where of course it might function as a culture medium, uh, but clearly uh, this is not as common as some people might think. In total, just under 2,500 patients were included, and I emphasize that early initiation of SGLT2s in acute congestive heart failure was associated with significant reductions in MACE, 90-day all-cause mortality, and also 38% reduction in heart failure readmission compared to standard medical therapy alone. Again, no renal complications between the two treatment groups. And in fact, the SGLT2s have shown significant benefit in the setting of chronic kidney disease. And hence, the authors concluded that early initiation of an SGLT2 may be safe and effective in acute congestive heart failure and improves 90-day all-cause mortality and reduces heart failure readmissions without increasing the risk of acute kidney injury or urinary tract infection. And of course, anything that is gonna be reducing not only heart failure readmission, but also mortality and MACE certainly needs to capture our attention. Our next study is rhythm heart failure. Now, this is amazing because actually it represents a novel characterization of mechanisms of death in heart failure. So often we assume that patients die suddenly in the setting of heart failure because of tachyarrhythmias. And Beggs and co-workers out of Scotland looked at this issue and clearly felt it was time to determine whether or not this was true. Uh, the study was fascinating because all patients were implanted with uh, a means by which to monitor heart rhythms. They enrolled 257 patients with heart failure. They noted 105 deaths during the course of the trial, and they were able to capture 58 terminal rhythms. 40 of the patients also underwent autopsies. When we look at the Clinical Endpoint Committee adjudicated heart failure deaths, 16 patients underwent autopsy, and it was found that two patients experienced an MI, one patient had a pulmonary embolism, and 13 patients were uh, deemed to have died from complications stemming from heart failure, including tachyarrhythmia, non-tachyarrhythmia, and then also one patient in whom it could not be determined. Among adjudicated sudden deaths, 
13 patients underwent autopsy, three of whom died of an MI, two from a pulmonary embolism, one died of non-cardiovascular causes, and the remaining seven uh, had autopsy negative, uh, sudden cardiac death, with three having tachyarrhythmia and four having non-tachyarrhythmia. And we see examples in the right panel here of patients who died, and clearly they did not have tachyarrhythmias, ventricular or otherwise, uh, and they were actually braiding down. So this is the first study to systematically characterize mechanisms of death and heart failure. Again, 105 deaths among 257 enrolled patients. The uh, terminal heart rhythm was captured in 58 patients' autopsies in 40. Of 29 deaths adjudicated to sudden cardiac death, non-tachyarrhythmic terminal rhythms were equally as common as ventricular arrhythmias. In sudden cardiac death patients with a ventricular arrhythmia, triggers of death identified at autopsy included MI, pulmonary embolism, implicating potentially reversible substrates for ventricular arrhythmia. In SCDs with a negative autopsy, non-tachyarrhythmic terminal rhythms were more common than ventricular arrhythmias. Of 30 patients adjudicated as experiencing pump failure death, potential pathological accelerants of death identified at autopsy, as mentioned, included MI and pulmonary embolism, implicating potentially reversible pathology. Fascinating. Finally, description of pathological triggers of ventricular arrhythmia-related sudden death suggesting possible treatment pathways. Demonstration of terminal rhythm does reliably associate with pathological cause of death. And description of a previously uncharacterized phenomenon that refutes conventional assumptions, sudden cardiac death with a negative autopsy where the terminal rhythm is not a ventricular arrhythmia. Now let's take a look at the real world place and clinical predictors of Ibrahimovic for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. And this is a very fascinating poster uh, by Haddad and coworkers. And this was performed in a tertiary academic care center. Uh, we see on the left side, the patient baseline characteristics, uh, heart failure class, etiology of the heart failure, uh, left ventricular ejection fractions, and the comorbidities, including hypertension, dyslipidemia, diabetes, chronic kidney disease, atrial fibrillation, and coronary disease. Uh, we also notice that uh, quadruple therapy adherence in this particular tertiary care center was really pretty good. Uh, you'll notice that for ischemic cardiomyopathy, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, uh, beta blockade was highly utilized. Um, the use of valsartan with uh, secubitrol, uh, also about two-thirds of patients. ACE inhibitor, ARBs, um, reduced between around 7 and 10%. But if you're uh, using uh, valsartan with an atrial natriuretic peptide uh, sustainer, uh, then clearly you're using a better drug compared to ACE or alone. Mineralocoid receptor antagonism, again, uh, really at optimal dose, about two-thirds of patients, and an SGLT2 inhibitor, optimal dose, uh, anywhere from three-quarters to about 80% of patients. So these patients were really well treated, and we see the split between uh, ischemic and non-ischemic etiologies on the right for heart failure. Uh, and other etiologies included valvular disease, tachycardia-induced, infiltrative, inflammatory, and toxic. Uh, we see um, that um, for patients, um, the use of beta blockade and um, quaternary uh, use of medication, quite good, quite good. So how about quadruple therapy at target doses? 47% quadruple therapy with uh, angiotensin II receptor antagonism uh, and an aprolysin inhibitor, 57%, quadruple therapy, 64%, triple therapy, 74%, and optimal heart failure, uh, reduced ejection fraction therapy at about two-thirds. Um, this is really pretty good. Um, 
you don't see numbers like this very often in the setting of heart failure, unfortunately. Um, and uh, you'll also notice that history of hospitalization for heart failure uh, between the ischemic and non-ischemic cardi cardiomyopathy groups um, is uh, pretty, pretty representative. So what they see, well, hospitalization for heart failure within 12 months was noted in about one in four patients. No statistically significant difference in heart failure hospitalization rates between ischemic and non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, interesting. Overall, 135 patients were on optimal pharmacological therapy for heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Um, and 27 patients were eligible for uh, varicigulat. Now, six patients had an indication for varicigulat, but were considered ineligible due to contraindications. Three had CKD with an estimated glomerular filtration rate less than 15, and three had a systolic blood pressure less than 100. Now, recall that uh, varicigulat uh, really does very well, uh, augments risk reduction uh, for the dual endpoint of mortality and hospitalizations for heart failure among patients who are less than 75, patients who experience a recent reduction in left ventricular ejection fraction, worsening of heart failure, or recent admission to hospital uh, for recurrent heart failure. Heart failure etiology does not predict various cigarette eligibility, uh, and brain natriuretic peptide levels in patients eligible for various cigarette was significantly higher than in not eligible patients. And I think uh, this is a pretty reasonable finding. Uh, here, you've got a very high percentage of patients on uh, quadruple therapy. And the question is, how do we best configure various cigarette? Um, is it the sickest patients? Is it patients who are uh, experiencing progression heart failure? And obviously, uh, if patients have higher uh, NT pro BNP levels, they're sicker, their heart failure is accelerating. CKD was significantly associated with increased odds of various cigarette eligibility. And left ventricular ejection fraction was an independent predictor of various cigarette eligibility. Uh, and that should come as no surprise. 13.5% of patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction followed at the heart failure clinic were eligible for a various cigarette over the previous 12 months of follow-up. And Obviously, there is a correlation between various cigarette eligibility and higher levels of BMP, lower left ventricular ejection fraction, and CKD, uh, which is exactly where uh, currently various cigarette is uh, positioned. There are numerous other trials underway uh, to see where else to configure various cigarette, uh, but right now that appears to be a very reasonable approach. Various cigarette eligibility remains difficult to predict and two thirds of heart failure patients with reduced ejection fraction are under optimal pharmacological therapy per the AHA, ACC and Heart Failure Society guidelines, uh, which at this medical center really is pretty good. Now, how about what's the impact of a pharmacist using telehealth um, to try to improve medication adherence in the setting of heart failure and see if this improves hospitalization uh, for uh, cardiac etiologies? And the answer is, it sure appears to. Here is a study by Chin and coworkers uh, looking at uh, whether or not a pharmacist communicating with patients uh, via telephone uh, improves adherence and improves heart failure hospitalization rates. If you look at um, patients who are on four uh, guideline uh, directed medical therapies. Look at this, compared to patients who did not receive telehealth assistance from a pharmacist, 39 versus 12%. That's a huge difference and a very important gap to close. And if you look at all cause hospitalizations, uh, definitely a, a, a very nice trend toward reducing this. And then if you look at cardiac hospitalizations, a very substantial reduction for patients who received a pharmacist uh, telehealth collaboration in terms of medication management, very impressive data. So when we look at this numerically, uh, what did 
assigning a pharmacist to a patient do? Well, the odds ratio for being on optimal goal-directed medical therapy with four drug classes is 2.27. I'll take that any day. All-cost hospitalization, um, not statistically significant, but clearly a 28% trend, but cardiac hospitalization statistically significant and a 74% relative risk reduction. Now, who wouldn't take that? What health system wouldn't take that? Uh, clearly, uh, the virtual pharmacist co-management of heart failure patients with reduced ejection fraction um, achieved rapid improvements in GDMT optimization, dramatic reductions in cardiac hospitalizations at six months with little effect on all cause or cardiac ED visits. But bottom line is to do this in just six months very clearly shows you the impact of following the guidelines and making sure that patients are on four medications that improve heart failure outcomes. Okay, now here is another study looking uh, at the Optum database, which included just under 108,000 patients by Morris and coworkers. They looked at what correlates with adherence to goal, excuse me, guideline-directed medical therapy in patients with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. Uh, we see here the demographics of the study. Uh, and uh, being Optum, it is widely representative of the United States. Uh, we see education level, household income, as well as comorbidities. And it's interesting because age over 70 uh, correlated with better long-term adherence. Male gender with reduced, if you were African-American or Hispanic, you had uh, reduced long-term adherence and if you had Medicare insurance, that had some of the best long-term adherence, interestingly. And if patient had previous peripheral vascular disease, better long-term adherence, chronic kidney disease, better long-term adherence. Now, in terms of three and four uh, guideline-directed medical therapy combinations, uh, you notice it's pretty tight. Um, and there's not a whole lot to, to say here uh, other than um, in, in some ways, um, there really isn't much difference. Now, <laughs> this is Greg Fonero's group, and they just do a fantastic job with this. Look at this in terms of individual medications, beta blocker, ACE inhibitor, ARB, um, a balsartan with a naprolyst inhibitor, mineral corticoid receptor antagonist, SGLT2 triple therapy, quadruple therapy. Now, this is community-based data, all right? So we saw what happened in a tertiary medical center. Now the numbers get a little discouraging here because when you look at beta blockade, beta blockers are cheap. Um, there is very uh, high level of use, 76%. And adherence in terms of 80% usage, 80% 80, 80 of days with patients taking the medication, 71%. Wow, that's pretty good. Now for ASARB, medications are generic, cheap, 61%, and 80% uh, adherence at 70%. Now when you go to ARB with the naprolysin inhibitor, 19% with 61% long-term adherence, Mineralocorticoid receptor antagonism, despite the fact that spironolactone is also very cheap, 26%, 68% long-term adherence. But now here's where things bottom out. And SGLT2, despite the fact that these medications are enormously beneficial in the setting of heart failure, 12%, still dramatically underprescribed, and a 66%, 80% uh, adherence rate. Now, how about triple therapy and quadruple therapy? Oh, my goodness. Here we have a problem. 12% for triple therapy with only a 45% adherence rate. And for quadruple therapy, 2%. There is a long way to go here. And obviously, when you're talking 12 and 2% for triple and quadruple therapy, in a database as representative as Optum, these are extremely poor numbers. Uh, so 
clearly there's heterogeneity in um, guideline-directed medical therapy use in the U.S. population with lowest use among newer uh, GDMT medication categories like the ARNIs and the SGLT2s. Adherence is lowest for the MRAs and newer medications. The newer ones obviously are more expensive. Also, utilization of triple and quadruple therapy low and adherence to these were suboptimal. Factors consistently associated with adherence to individual and combination GDMTs or race, region, and history of diabetes. Medicare insurance have the strongest association with adherence um, and identification of patient characteristics associated with adherence to GDMT, including quadruple therapy, stress the need for tailored management strategies to help improve outcomes in this patient population with high unmet need. Uh, these data are pretty discouraging, um, and we really need to ante up and help these patients understand why these drugs are so important, why adherence is so important, and what each one of these drugs, how they impact morbidity and mortality, uh, and perhaps then we can increase long-term adherence rates. Now, last but not least, heart failure and impaired cognitive function. Uh, this is based on a, a National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey uh, by Fioro Monti, Gorchow, and coworkers. They looked at 5,951 patients who were 60 years or older, and 412 of these in the NHANES database were found to have heart failure, so 7.4%. We see the demographic features of these patients off to the right. And of these, 199 were female and 213 were male. The incidence of heart failure in this analysis cohort was similar to that of the wider U.S. population, uh, and that is typically true of NHANES since it is broadly representative of the entire U.S. population at a given point in time. We see here that in multivariate analysis that uh, there are a number of things that correlated with the combination of heart failure and impaired cognitive function. And uh, these included race, education clearly correlates and has been shown to correlate in many, many studies. And then uh, there's also a correlation with not having dyslipidemia, uh, not having hypertension. And then there is a correlation with having depression, a prior history of a stroke, and alcohol consumption. So what they see? Well, what they did was they uh, had each of these patients um, perform the digital symbol substitution test. And this DSST, it's basically a paper and pencil cognitive test. It's on a single sheet of paper. It actually has uh, better validity than a mini mental status examination. And it requires that a patient match symbols to numbers according to a key located on the top of the page. Uh, each patient copies the symbol into spaces below a row of numbers. And what they found was that for patients with heart failure, the DSST score uh, was in fact lower than patients who didn't have heart failure. And the authors conclude uh, that, cognitive, that cognitive impairment is more common amongst patients with heart failure. The lower scores noted for the patients with heart failure uh, is within the range of mild cognitive impairment, a validated pre-dementia stage. Obviously, more research is needed in this area, but some of the uh, hypothesized reasons for uh, impaired cognitive function uh, would include reduced cerebral perfusion, uh, the loss to some degree of autoregulation, uh, perhaps uh, intracerebral vascular inflammatory change, uh, and others. Thank you again for joining us for ACC conference coverage, clinical clips and heart failure. We hope you found this podcast useful and educational. To receive continuing education credit and to download your printable certificate, please go to the activity page at practice.cme.com to complete the post-test and evaluation to receive continuing education credit.